Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors, America's only daily outdoor TV show. Your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors. I'm Winston Chester. Glad you're with us on this Monday morning, starting off the first full week of June, June the 7th. We've got a big week this week and all kinds of good things happening in the month of June. So let's get started with our weather brought to us by Gulf Coast Air Conditioning, Drew Pollard and his small town business up there, really doing a great job helping people out. So give them a call on the air conditioning needs. High today, 83. Low only going down to 73. Water temperature staying around 81 at the end of the pier. Our Monday moon phase brought to us by Mountain Dew. On the outdoors with Mountain Dew. We're looking at uh, not much of a, a sliver of a moon tonight. We've got the new moon coming up Thursday, and the full moon this month of June will be on the 24th. At, in a couple of weeks, about three weeks from now, will be the full moon. So we're going to start, uh, got a new moon starting on Thursday, so things will be happening then. Our tide chart brought to us by Kent Forest Lawn. We're looking at the high tide at 740 this morning and a low tide at 604 tonight. And this week is going to be a week of really good tides that get better each day. Really strong tides all week. It's going to be some good fishing in, a, in the tidal flats and all because of that moving tide. Today's wind now, again, coming in double figures out of southwest at 10 to 20. I, I like it when you get from 10 to 20. That's such, such a wide uh, degree right there, 10, 10 to 20. So anywhere in between. All right, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. You know, all kinds of things happen on, on Panhandle Outdoors, and I get all kinds of videos and all, but this one, um, before I get to it, I want to talk about it. It's very unique. The, you don't normally catch a, a sailfish, okay? You don't normally fish for them. So sailfish is sort of top of the line if people want to catch sailfish, you know, and marlin and all, and, and you sort of have to target them. But, so it's rare to catch them, uh, and it's really rare to catch them on a kayak. Well, Brock Meyer took, a, took one of his customers out the other day. Check this out, folks. They hooked a sailfish. It's a real short video. I'm going to run it a couple of times off of a kayak, let's run it again. Now what's remarkable, first of all, it's close to shore, you can see the trees and all in the background. One more time, this just don't happen, but the icing on the cake, this is this customer's first time ever fishing out of a kayak in the Gulf. So anyway, that, that goes to show you, you know, anything can happen out there and, and it, it's just, I, I told him that, that is very unusual for that kind of stuff to happen. And he, uh, he agreed too. They, he, he told me about it. They, they didn't keep it up very long because they didn't want to get too tired. But got up by the kayak. He took some still pictures to that real quick short video. He could have had a longer video, but he wanted to go ahead and release them. So congratulations, Brock. And we're going to get him to come back on the show. He hasn't been in Studio A yet. And when he came on the show that first time, he was over in Studio B. So he's going to be wild at Studio A. So anyway, good job, Brock Meyer, on catching and releasing a tarpon. I know that customer. He's spoiled now. <laughs> that just don't happen very often. Okay, let's look at some pictures. Let's start off with a good one. My buddy Tom Gurley is always taking good ones. Uh, how about duck and duckweed? And I imagine this is at a state park. And this duckweed is very prevalent this time of year. It just, uh, it just grows in the water. And, it, and <laughs> it's funny though how the ducks get in. That's why I call it duckweed. So I uh, love getting pictures from Tom. How about uh, Terrace down there at Blue Water Outriggers, okay. The Feeder Creek, okay, that I, that I live on finally got, got right. Now he's been watching the show, can you tell? Caught dinner on my favorite beetle spin, Terry at Blue Water. So look at there. We're talking about Feeder Creeks and when things get right, and this is what happens. So good job, Terry at Blue Water. I want to wish a happy 103rd birthday to Mr. Buck Buchanan. We've been on the show before, I've done interviews with him, 103 and going strong. And he's, uh, I did an in-depth interview with him. I wanted him to come on the show. He lives up there in Chipley with his son Fred, and he's just a remarkable man. He was born and raised in West Bay. And you're talking about some stories that he told, I still I have them on, on, on tape and all on video, of growing up in West Bay 100 years ago when he was three years old, I mean, and uh, the 
families and, and all kinds of remarkable things before the intercoastal was built. And he was talking about how clear the water was and the grass flats and all, and just remarkable memory and all. He's doing great. I, he was, last time I talked to him, he was driving and mowing his yard. And you don't, you don't do that on the street. So anyway, try to get him to come on the show. Fred's gonna try to, we're gonna try to get up with him again, but happy birthday, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, coming from Larry Brown over here off the Choctaw Hatchie, he's got his, he's got his buddy Aiden Harrison. Most folks use their salt rifle to shoot flies, but now the hunting season's over, Aiden Harrison salts his tomatoes with it. Those little salt guns that he's salting his tomatoes. And I, uh, he's been on before. In fact, uh, Larry went there told me he said he shoots yellow flies. Between shooting yellow flies, he salts his tomatoes. He's a natural born hunter. He's got two deer this year. So thanks, Larry Brown. Hope things are going well over there. But you folks that want to go to the beach and, and, and take your chicken, I know some of y'all are real uh, close to your to your animals and all, and some of y'all are close to your chicken. So they have this special made cage that you can take your chicken to the beach with. And you know your chicken would appreciate it. I don't know wh where to order them, but you can get them. Okay, FWC put out some put out something. It's information. Okay, report wild turkey sightings. Help us learn more about the wild turkey population. So if you see some wild turkeys between now and the 31st, they're interested in hens, with or without young ones. Okay, and here, if you see a if you see a group like this, call them up. My FWC. And just trying, they're trying to get some surveys just from the public themselves. And I know uh, this time of year, you can see them grouped up like that. So that'd be interesting. And speaking of which, <laughs> they sent this out. Don't quit hunting just because this summer. Try wild hog hunting instead. And this is from the FWC. And they suggested it. And you know, we've been talking about it for years now to go ahead and do this. And now they're, they're, they must have been watching our show. But you know, these, these hogs, they're plentiful, and they're, they're fun to hunt. And in fact, I, I also saw, this is from National Geographic, they call, them, they call them the ecological zombies. They will eat almost anything and can live almost anywhere. And that's the pig, so the Na National Geographic, I wanna know more about them, so uh, you know, they're even studying. So hogs are, hogs are really amazing. And one more announcement from the FWC, this is, we're going to sneak up on us now. The, yeah, I know it's a small print, but the phase one application period for fall quota special opportunity hunts at National Wildlife Refuge, fall and winter hunts, closes June, June the 15th at 11.59. So June 15th. You only have about a week now to get your quota hunt permits for, for those special areas and also for the National, <clears throat> well, National Wildlife Refuge. And I'm assuming they're talking about, uh, I'm sure they're talking about St. Vincent Island, so I don't know if they do a special one in addition to that or not. But we'll check it out and let you know. Let's take a break and we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. And hope, you, uh, hope you're having a good day, getting ready to start off a, a great week and all, doing some stuff, some stuff in the outdoors. But one thing you got to keep in mind in the outdoors right now are the yellow flies and the mosquitoes. I finally got bit by a mosquito the other day. So we always talk, talk about it because in the outdoors it's, it's prevalent this time of year. And I've got to think about uh, mosquitoes. Uh, we'll talk about them later. But yellow flies, uh, the Florida A&M had a lab at the end over there by Robinson Bayou at the end of Frankfurt, all the way to the end of it. It was really a neat place. And I was interested in it. In fact, I went over there. This was uh, when I started the show, and I wanted to just talk to these, these scientists, these entomologists, and they're Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so, really nice people, and I, I visited them several times, and we're talking about mosquitoes and yellow flies and the best way to, you know, to prevent them and all, and I, I started thinking about it last night, so I went and found one, I have one or two on mosquitoes, I have one little uh, video on, on uh, yellow flies, and I pulled it out because yellow flies <laughs> are strong right now. And they're just a unique, and uh, I'm gonna, we're going to run this video. But I want you to look and think about uh, that all the different, they have, you know, different yellow flies. But all basically, we talk about dog flies, or well, dog fly and yellow fly are the same thing. A yellow fly is just a yellow dog fly, it's just different colorations. But you know, it's not dog flies and yellow flies 
or the same insect. And I, I learned that from them. I always thought it was two different monsters, but it's just one monster in two different colors. So anyway, uh, I, I was interested in, in sharing this back with you and just seeing what you think. But notice, uh, they, they're one of the first ones to come out with that really big, sticky, uh, black-colored ball. They're one of the first ones to come out. I think people watch the show and then get a, got a patent on it. So, uh, Jeff, let's run this video. All right, folks, we're here at the end of Frankfurt Avenue, Florida A&M University. John Morenon Sr., Public Health Entomology Research and Education Center. And this is a, like a lab right here on this beautiful point. We're going in, I've met these guys before, and they're really dedicated scientists, and we're going in to find out something about yellow flies and mosquitoes. And uh, we're just real proud to have them here in Panama City and have a lot of knowledge. So uh, let's go in here and talk to them. All right, folks, I hear the FAMU laboratory in this long area right here is where they put some mosquitoes out here. And our guest today, I'm gonna let him introduce himself and tell us, tell us what he does. Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Selick. I'm a medical veterinary entomologist here at the John A. Mulren Public Health Entomology Research and Education Center. Is we do a lot of work in, with mosquitoes, biology, ecology, and control. And today we're gonna to be talking about some non-toxic ways of getting rid of or minimizing your problem with yellow flies. So we're talking about yellow flies today. Yes. Okay, now tell us about your background, where you did your work. Uh, my BS is in uh, Purdue University, and uh, I did an MS at LSU and a PhD at University of Kentucky, all on entomology. Uh, medical and veterinary entomology is the science of studying arthropods that affect man and his animals. Okay, and this structure behind you, I was calling it, what, what do we call all this area here? This is a large walk-in screen where we test attractants for mosquitoes. One of the things that we want to do is these traps that you see on the market, we want to see if we can go ahead and enhance them so that they actually do a lot better than uh, right now, which they don't do a whole lot. They will collect some mosquitoes, but not as much as the homeowner wants. Okay. All right, so we're going to go in the lab. You're going to show us some uh, work on the yellow flies, right? Sure, let's go. Okay. Okay, this particular lab is a biting fly and tick control area. Are we in the right, we in the right place? Yes. All right, here we go. We'll go up here and see what these scientists are doing. Okay, uh, that's the well, first thing you want to show us would be the collection right here. Tell us what this yeah, is. Yeah, there are about 15 uh, species of yellow flies. There's, here's a, showing a, a couple on that. And actually, yellow flies are just really yellow-colored deer flies. Uh, but there is one particular species. That is really called the yellow fly. And that's it about right here. Now, why is that particular one? Is that, that's the one we just see around here a lot? Yes, and that's really our, the ones that we have problems in from about April through uh, June. Okay. And they're the ones that, uh, for people who are allergic to them, they're the, they, these are the ones that really give them a bad time on that. Well, they're by, I think we've all been bitten by them. That is a strong, strong bite. Now, one of the things that we wanted to do early on was try to see if we can go ahead and manage the, these pests, or can we control them? Can we trap them out of a backyard uh, so that people can go ahead and, and uh, uh, enjoy their backyard picnics, pools, stuff like that? Also, too, given that, there is also a movement that has been for the past, oh, five, ten years to control pests as with least toxic as possible. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we took the idea of some of the veterinary entomologists that use ball, uh, dark colored balls to uh, control some livestock pests like horse flies and stuff like that, and we adapted it to the yellow fly. If we could go ahead and manipulate that post finding behavior, that biting behavior where they're trying to find you for a blood meal, then we can use it against the insect and in that, in that case control it. So what we did, what we came up with, was a beach ball that you could go ahead and treat with black paint. That gives you your dark silhouette. And then, if, then as a uh, yellow fly is looking for you, they're looking for that movement. When you're walking along the outside of a forest, is they're looking for that movement. They're looking for an animal. 
And so if you could go ahead and put this from, let's say, a branch, let the wind suspend for it, and if you could go ahead and spray a adhesive on the ball, then when that fly goes ahead and lands on it, thinking this is an animal, it's going to get ready for the blood meal, it can't get back off. So therefore, you've trapped it, you've, you've gotten it out of the way, you've controlled it. So you just hang that up and let it dangle back and forth, and because yes. they're looking for movement. That's right. They're looking for movement and, uh, and just a little bit of a breeze. There's also a little bit of a shimmer that comes off with the, uh, with the ball, too, when, it's, when it has that adhesive on there. And that probably maybe gets their, their eye, and then they go ahead and they home in right on it. Okay. And that's really strong. You, said, you were telling me that's probably stronger than insect repellent because they, they can get these, these are strong bugs. <laughs> right, yes. Uh, yellow flies are fairly robust insects. Most, insect, uh, most mosquito repellents were made for mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And so when you compare a mosquito to that very robust yellow fly, there's no difference. It's, it, it's, it's night and day on that. So it would take an awful lot of repellent to go ahead and affect the um, relief that you want. So basically, repellents are not that well uh, used for sportsmen and hunters and stuff like that, simply because of that. So we just hang that up around a tree stand? Yes, hang up a it would, it, that would work very well. Go ahead and uh, if you've got uh, a lot of yellow flies uh, down uh, when, when you're on the ground there, hang that out, let them go for it, mm -hmm. and uh, then you can concentrate on your animal. Uh, now, what's the uh, most important time of the day when, when they're out? When, when... We, there are two basic time periods that we identified for most of the yellow fly problem. It's real early around dawn and then just about dusk. And we think that's the reason because that's when their animal hosts are waking up or getting ready to go ahead and go to sleep and then they're going to feed on them while they're, while they're uh, resting. And the life cycle, how long do they live? Uh, they live probably for about three, four weeks possibly on that. As, as it gets warmer, your uh, lifespan goes down. But these are aquatic insects. Okay. So anything, bottomland swamps, cypress swamps, uh, ponds with cattails around them on that, uh, those are probably the places where these, where these develop. All right. Well, thank you so much. That's, that's good information for our Panhandle sportsmen. You're welcome. Okay, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that. Very informative. Like I said, they were the first ones to start in inventing that. I don't know what happened in the laboratory. They just closed down, but it was some really good stuff. And they, they really, I, I spent a lot, a lot of hours over there just listening to them and watching them. So um, if I find it, I got a mosquito one, I may show it to you, but it's, it's some really good stuff where, they, you know, good tests and all different things they recommend. So I just like those kind of things too. want to share it with you. Fish and game time today brought to us by Blue Water Outriggers. We're looking at 9.37 to 11.37 this morning, tonight, 9.59 to 11.59. Let's just say 10 to 12. Okay, I want to show you the location where that place was. It's interesting because uh, it was a great location. I know it's prime location. This is, as you see on Google Earth here, I'm going to keep it in the center. You see, it, you know, uh, North Bay and Lynn Haven and Pretty Bayou. And, okay, so I'm going to zoom in on it. And what it was was right down in here. Uh, this area right in here. Robinson Bayou, which is a neat area, but right here in the center, right there was actually where the lab was. You're talking about a prime piece of property. That's where the mercury uh, motor people are going to start testing their mercuries. People, there was a little bit of controversy about different things there, but boy, it would have been great. It wouldn't have been great if the city could have bought that property and made it, or, the, or the government and made it like a little park and launch a kayak and all there. Anyway, uh, they didn't, so... Let's uh, let's move on. I wanted. I've been wanting. I started last week. I want to talk about the June activities you can do. I always make my list. But one of the first thing popped up. The number one thing popped up is go crabbing. Went over there in Navarre Beach last week. <laughs> At night, I, I looked down on the beach and and uh, you could see I, I want six to seven different uh, fr lights. You know, lights shining in the water. It was mainly people just taking kids crabbing. I thought what a great activity because those kids would have great memories. In fact, one of, some of our family took a couple of little kids out 
and they saw a couple little things and kids thought you know they thought they'd seen alligators and sharks and all that the way they talked but uh, just go crabbing crabbing night or you know crab you know crab during the day you can set up some crab traps and all but the actual wade and crabbing uh, in at light kids will love that another thing I also talked about uh, want to talk about gigging flounder gigging starts getting good now because uh, it, you know they're, they're sort of they're fattening up a little bit and they're really working around those holes so they haven't started moving out yet but they're just sort of moving around and feeding really good this time of year uh, the third one uh, and I wrote this down too. We're on the tail end. In fact, I, I knew it. But I got a couple of different messages last week, one from St. George Island and one from over the West End, that the pompano season, the, the pompano run, has sort of fizzled out. It's, it's sort of finished, and that's exactly what happens. It you know comes in strong in in April and May. By June, it's, it's about wrapped up, and so it started wrapping up about last week. Now you can still catch pompano. You still will catch pompano. And it'd be hard to limit out right now in a short period of time, but you can do it. So anyway, if you want to, you know, go run on out there this week if you get a chance and try to catch a pompano if you want to catch some. If not, target some other species. Uh, number four, yeah, I always I say this every month: go camping. <laughs> Camp while, while the nights are still a little bit cool because when July gets here, the nights going to be warm. So camping in, in a cool place and all. Uh, the state parks are opening back up. Uh, in, in good order, the ones to the west of us have been open, and uh, St. Joe State Park was still not open, but in other places, the Torreal State Park, I believe, is open, and, and Fallen Waters, are there are camping areas are available, so if you have a chance, take advantage of those. Now, that's four. I've got six more. We'll just pick these others up tomorrow, but anyway, start making your plans on some things you want to do. I know Jeff's going to take off and do some uh, fishing in, in a little bit, and uh, all of y'all, June is just a good month to be getting out. It's not too hot. It's still nice and cool as far as early mornings, late afternoon. So take advantage of it and try to make some plans to do that. And even if you got to travel different places and, and you know got to rent a motel or something, do that. But take your fishing stuff with you. You always you can always have it. You use it or not. Like I went to the bar, had my fishing stuff with me, but I didn't use it. But I felt comfortable when I lay down at night because my fishing rod and reel was in my was in the back of the car. All right, I'm going to wrap it up for today. Uh, enjoyed the show. I hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed it. Do something good for someone today. You have a great day. Enjoy our Florida Panhandle Outdoors, and God bless. Thanks for watching America's only daily outdoor TV show, Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester, featuring hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.